Hello and welcome to this biopsychology topic video, this one looking at infradian and ultradian rhythms, how to outline and evaluate them. This video again is one of three and in part two we'll look at how to answer different types of exam questions and then in part three we'll look at how we might structure an essay on this particular topic. So let's start by outlining and evaluating infradian and ultradian rhythms. Now before we begin it's worth noting that there are three different biological rhythms including infradian, circadian and ultradian. An easy way to remember these is using the phrase ICU with the longest at the top and the shortest at the bottom. So the longest rhythm, infradium, is longer than 24 hours and the shortest rhythm, ultradium, is less than 24 hours and then you're left with circadian in the middle which is seen as approximately 24 hours. So let's start by looking at infradium rhythms. Now biological rhythms are cyclical patterns within biological systems, so humans, that have evolved in response to different environmental influences. Now an important biological rhythm is the infradium rhythm and this lasts for longer than 24 hours and can be weekly, monthly or even yearly. Now examples of this rhythm include the female menstrual cycle, seasonal affective disorder and hibernation in animals. So let's look at the first two of those, the human examples, and see how they fit in. Now an example of a monthly infradian rhythm is the female menstrual cycle which is regulated by hormones that either promote ovulation or stimulate the uterus for fertilisation. Ovulation occurs roughly halfway through the cycle when oestrogen levels are at their highest and usually lasts for 16 to 32 hours as you can see highlighted on screen now. After ovulation has taken place, progesterone levels increase in preparation for the possible implantation of an embryo in the uterus and you can see there on screen now the endometrium which is the membrane lining the uterus gets larger uh, as we prepare for this phase. Okay. Now it's important to note that although the typical menstrual cycle is around 28 days, there is considerable variation with some women experiencing a short cycle of 23 days and others experiencing a much longer cycle which goes up to 36 days. Okay? Now there's an important exam hint and tip that goes here and it says while it's logical to assume that infradian rhythms, in particular the menstrual cycle, are governed by internal factors, what we would call endogenous pacemakers, such as hormonal changes, Research actually suggests that these rhythms are heavily influenced by external factors, what we come to know as exogenous zeitgebers. Okay? So it's important to note that and we'll come on to that in the evaluation section shortly. A second example of a infradian rhythm is seasonal affective disorder, which is abbreviated to SAD, okay, which is related to the seasons. And research has found seasonal variation in mood, where some people become depressed in winter months, which is sometimes why it's known as winter blues, uh, and SAD is an infradian rhythm that is governed on a yearly cycle. Now psychologists argue that melatonin, which is secreted by the pineal gland during night, is partly responsible for this. And they argue that the lack of light during the winter months results in a longer period of melatonin secretion. And this increase in melatonin has been linked to the depressive symptoms. Okay? I think it's useful to know a second example, although you certainly need one, but I just think it's sometimes easier for certain types of exam questions if you have another example up your sleeve. Okay? Just want to go back to that exam hint that I mentioned a moment ago and I'll just read it again. So it says, while it is logical to assume that infradian rhythms, in particular the menstrual cycle, are governed by internal factors, such as hormonal changes, research suggests that these infradian rhythms are heavily influenced by external factors. So let's look at some re research around infradian rhythms and then see how this plays out. Now, research suggests that the menstrual cycle is, to some extent, governed by exogenous site gavers, okay, which are external factors. For example, Reinberg in 1967 examined a woman uh, in a case study method who spent three months in a cave with only a small lamp to provide light. Reinberg noted that her menstrual cycle actually shortened from 28 days to roughly 25.7 days. Now the important bit here is these results suggest that the lack of light, which is an exogenous site gaver, an external factor, in the cave affected her menstrual cycle and therefore demonstrates the effect of external influences on infradian rhythms. So there's one piece of evidence that highlights that examiner hint. Okay. On top of that, researchers also suggested by Russell uh, that the menstrual cycle can become synchronised with other females just through odour exposure. In one study, sweat samples from one group of women were rubbed onto the upper lip of another group of women. And despite the fact that these two groups of women were separate, their menstrual cycle synchronised. Okay. And again, this suggests that the synchronization of the menstrual cycle can be affected by pheromones, which again is an external factor, which have an effect on people nearby rather than on the person producing them. So again, highlighting how infradian rhythms are influenced by external factors. 
Now, there's a really interesting point here. The evolutionary psychologists argue that the synchronised menstrual cycle provides an evolutionary advantage for groups of women because the synchronisation of pregnancies means that children can be shared for among multiple mothers who have them and therefore we're sharing actually the resources available. Okay. So there we have it for infradiam rhythms. Let's now turn our attention to ultradiam rhythms, which are those that last less than 24 hours. Okay? So ultradiam rhythms last fewer than 24 hours, and they can be found uh, in patterns of human sleep. And another good example is human meal patterns, because we tend to eat three times a day on average, and appetite rises and falls in between food consumption. Okay? Now the human sleep cycle is an interesting and quite complicated area because the cycle alternates between what's known as REM sleep, dream sleep, which is highlighted on yellow in screen, okay, which is stage five sleep, and non-REM sleep, non-rapid eye movement sleep, which consists of stages one through to four. Now the cycle starts in the light sleep, progressing to deep sleep, and then REM sleep where brainwaves speed up and dreaming occurs. And this cycle repeats about every 90 minutes throughout the night. And a hu average human might experience five of these per night, depending upon how many hours sleep you get. Okay. Now, if we break that down, so a complete cycle goes through four stages of non-REM sleep first before entering REM sleep, and then repeats itself. Now research using EEG, which we looked at in a previous webinar, has highlighted distinct brainwave patterns during each of these different stages of sleep. So in light sleep, which I've highlighted on, on screen now, stages one and two, these are known as light sleep. During these stages, brainwave patterns become more slower and more rhythmic, starting with alpha waves progressing through to theta waves. Okay. Then in stage th stages three and four, which are known as deep sleep or slow wave sleep stages, and where it's often associated with where it's difficult to wake someone up. These stages are associated with delta waves. Okay. Finally, in stage five, which is the dream sleep, the REM sleep, the body is paralyzed to stop a person acting out their dream, and their brain activity resembles that of an awake person. So we might get a desynchronized uh, wave pattern in the brain, uh, which is similar to that of someone who is awake and conscious. Okay. Now, on average, the entire cycle repeats every 90 minutes, and a person might experience up to five full cycles per night. And this is important, so I've gone into this level of detail for a reason. Okay? If we look at an exam hint here, again, uh, the examiner's comment that when providing an example of an ultra DM rhythm, answers need to explicitly mention that the cycle occurs more than once every 24 hours. Furthermore, specific details in relation to the distinctive characteristics of the different stages, in this case of sleep, are required to demonstrate understanding. And we'll come on to that in part two of the video where we attempt to answer some exam style questions on the, on the different rhythms. Okay. Just as an extension, another ultra DM rhythm that I mentioned earlier is appetite on meal patterns in humans. And most humans eat three meals a day and appetite rises and falls in relation to food, food consumption. Okay. Now, a very complex looking diagram on the screen, but for those of you studying the eating behaviour topic in the year two topics, may be aware of the underlying neural or biological mechanisms involved in the control of eating. So a, a great ultra DM rhythm if you're studying this topic would actually be human meal patterns. Okay. Again, let's take a look at evaluation. So in terms of evaluating ultra DM rhythms, key research suggests again that ultra DM rhythms are more flexible than, than humans originally thought or psychologists originally thought. Uh, there's an interesting case study again of someone called Randy Gardner who remained awake for 264 hours and after this experience he just slept for 15 hours over several nights and then he recovered 25% of his lost sleep in total of which he recovered 70% of stage 4, 50% of stage 5 which is REM but very little of the other stages. And again, if we think about what that suggests, it highlights the degree of flexibility, the large degree of flexibility in terms of the different stages within the ultra DM rhythm and the variable nature of biological rhythms in this case. Okay, So it just goes to show they're not as fixed as we originally thought. Furthermore, other research supports this idea and highlights the key individual differences in ultra DM rhythms. For example, uh, Tucker et al. found significant differences between participants in terms of the duration of each stage of sleep, particularly in stages three and four, which are those just before REM sleep, the deep sleep stages. And this demonstrates that there may be innate individual differences in ultra DM rhythms, which uh, means that it's worth focusing on these differences during investigations and maybe taking a slightly different approach. Okay. Now, I've also put a, a note on the screen there that it's also worth considering ideographic versus nomothetic approaches, the nature of the research, which is often highly controlled, and therefore issues around e ecological validity. Okay? 
because many people say that the way in which such research is conducted may actually tell us little about ultradian rhythms in humans. For example, when investigating sleep patterns, uh, participants are often subject to real high levels of control. They're attached to monitors that measure their rhythms. And these may be invasive for the participant, lead them to sleep in a way that doesn't represent their ordinary sleep cycle and therefore makes investigating such rhythms difficult and thereby lacking ecological validity, which could lead to a false conclusion being drawn in relation to ultradian rhythms. Okay. So there you have it. In this video, we've looked at how to outline and evaluate infradian and ultradian rhythms. And in the next part, we're going to use this information to answer some exam style questions. Again, I hope you found this video and the others in the series useful. Thank you for watching and goodbye now.